Hi, my name is Karen Mas. Let's try that again. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> we have to respond. <laughs> okay. Hi. 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 Thank you. <laughs> my name is Karen Mas, and I am a student here at New York High School. I'm a senior. I moved here. I moved to the United States from the Democratic Republic of Congo when I was 11. I didn't speak any English, and when I came here, I knew that it was important for me to learn, so I tried my best. <laughs> I remember understanding a joke and thinking to myself, wait, I think I finally got this. <laughs> when I first moved here, I lived in Buffalo. My middle school wasn't very diverse. And I remember struggling with the, the language and often worry about my future. In my middle school and growing up, I didn't really think much about college. It wasn't something we talked about. But I decided that I want to be the first one in my family to get a bachelor degree in America. Amen. <laughs> With the support of my mom at home and my teachers here at Newell High School, everything changed. At Newell, we all came, come from different countries and culture. I have some of my closest friends from Ghana, Senegal, Bangladesh, China, the DR and Yemen. Many of us, many of our parents didn't go to college, but, and some of us thought that we wouldn't either. But our teachers and staff believed in every single one of us. Amen. They challenged us and they made us stronger and better. All of our teachers have the highest expectation for us. It shows in the courses that are given to us here. With the AP for All program, there's a lot of AP classes that are offered at New World. We have AP Bio, AP US, we have English, and we have Spanish. I've taken several, and I feel prepared. I already have 12 college credits under my belt. And some of my friends have more than 20 credits. Wow. <clears throat> Sometimes when I talk about my experience here, people assume that I go to a specialized high school but I always say proudly, nope, I go to New World High School. <laughs> Though, through my classes at New World, I realized I want to be a lawyer and go to law school. Amen. And to make that happen, I need to graduate, go to college, and major in political science. Right. Our, our, teach, our school has helped us see ourselves as college students and college graduates. We do a lot of college visits, which gives us an idea of where we want to go. In addition, this school gave me an opportunity to participate in many extracurricular activities and to be part of the school leadership team, where I work with teachers, students, parents, administration to make decisions about the school. I'm so happy that I've already been accepted to SUNY uh, Onianta. Thank you very much. <laughs> But I've also applied to other top schools like Stony Brook, Fordham, Binghamton, and Bard. I'm waiting to hear back from them this spring, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> my future is bright, and it's all thanks to my friends, my family, my teachers, the administration, and the hardworking staff here at New High School. I want to give a shout out to all my friends, our teachers, our students, here at New High School, and I welcome you to our community. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the mayor. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce the mayor. The, oh my God. <laughs> it's, my, <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Mayor de Blasio. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, that was wonderful. We are so proud of you. Yeah. You know, Karen. We are so proud of you. Now, 
I'm like listening to you speak in front of all these adults, all these cameras and all, and to know that you only learned English in the last few years <laughs> is unbelievable. And, and that's a credit to you and your hard work and your parents and your teachers and everyone in the school community. And I know everyone in the school community supports each other and learning. And this is a beautiful picture of New York City at its finest right here. So there is good news in this world, my friends. And we are here to celebrate. Uh, first, we got to talk about New World. This high school, uh, not only does it exemplify the values of the city, it's a place for everyone. It's a place where everyone is respected. Everyone can reach their potential. That is what New York City is all about, right? Yes. That's what we believe in. Let me tell you, in 2017, so not last year, but the year before, this amazing high school already had an 87% graduation rate. In 2018, New World took their graduation rate up to 90%. Isn't that amazing? The sky is the limit here. And to everyone uh, in this school, uh, everyone, the, the school leadership, and I want to thank the leadership of the school, the teachers, everyone who works at the school, the parents who support their children, and the students who support each other. You have a lot to be proud of. Congratulations. <laughs> but now I have some congratulations that go to all five boroughs, to every neighborhood, to all of our school system and everyone who works in it. Chancellor, you should be very proud today. Your team, your leaders, all the principals, the educators all over the school system, the parents all over New York City. Because for the fifth straight year, the graduation rate has gone up in New York City. And we are now at our all-time highest graduation rate in the history of New York City. Congratulations, everyone. For the first time in our history, more than three quarters of our kids are graduating and going on to greater things. More than three quarters, and we're going higher every single year. This is an amazing, amazing thing. This is the kind of thing that would not have been imaginable just a few years ago. I want people to understand how much hard work has been put into this effort. We came here with the idea that we were going to shake the foundations of our school system. Five years ago, we said the status quo was not acceptable. And things had to change. The equity and excellence vision was the way to do it. And what Karen talked about, those AP courses, are a great example. Every high school will have them now. It used to be a lot of high schools didn't have any advanced placement courses, which sent a message to students like Karen and all of her friends that you're not destined for the greatest heights. We're not even going to offer you advanced placement. What a horrible, misguided message that was. And on a very practical level, young people were ready to go farther, ready to meet their potential in the here and now, didn't have a chance to do it. Now, listen to what Karen said, 12 credits that she's gotten. She said some kids have gotten over 20 credits. That's extraordinary. But they only get to get those credits if the AP courses are in their school. That's what equity and excellence is all about. So we don't believe that the stereotypes of the past should govern us. There used to be the quote-unquote good schools and the quote-unquote bad schools. We want to weed out that language by making it obsolete. We want every school to reach its greatness. Now, Karen said something else. Your remarks were filled with many powerful passages. <laughs> Very impressive. When people said, oh my god, you, you, know, you learned to speak English so well, you have all these advanced placement courses, did you go to a specialized school? And you said, no, I went to New World. Because there are a lot of New Worlds out there. There's a lot of great high schools in this city, and they're getting greater. So what does it mean that almost 76% of our kids are graduating? 
Let's make this a very human reality first. Think what it means for a young person that they go through that last year and they graduate and they are off to opportunity, whether it is a college education or some other type of training program or right into the workforce, whatever it may be, that they have succeeded on that first and most important opportunity to get that high school degree. And think what it means for families. So many families in this town are struggling to make ends meet, but you know the one thing they will always do is support their children no matter what. The children's education comes first because they want to see the next generation do better. And that dream is still alive in this city. It's a dream that's challenged all over this country, but here we believe the next generation can actually do better. But that's only possible through our public schools. And it's only possible if our kids graduate and can keep moving forward. So for families all over this city, it's not a statistic to them, it's their own lives, it's their own child that met with the kind of success that might not have been possible just a few years ago. In the years since mayoral control of education was instituted, it's about 15 years now, the graduation rate in this city has increased by 50% because there was leadership and accountability. Just in the years that this administration has been in, just five years now, when we came in, the graduation rate was just over 68%. It is now 76%. We're moving forward. And it's not just an achievement unto itself. I know you're gonna hear from the chancellor a few years ago, when Chancellor Farina was in office, we said, what was a goal we could shoot for that would be a game changer for New York City? We said, well, the national standard at that time a few years ago was 80%. So he said, we're going to shoot for 80%. We're going to be as good as the whole country. Even though New York City public schools had struggled for decades and decades, we're going to catch up with the rest of the United States of America. And we said, it's going to take some time. And we put out a plan publicly. With this progress we're reporting to you today, we are now well ahead of schedule to reach that 80% goal and then surpass it. This city is proving that public education can surpass all expectations, and it's happening very, very rapidly. And it's not just about graduation from high school. Here's the other fact that's so important. We reported this a few weeks back. The young people graduated this last summer 2018, 59% of them, 59% went directly to college or another type of training program. 59% also all-time record for the city of New York, and that number is going to keep growing as well. It's going to make a huge difference in people's lives. So I want you to know we are very proud today of everyone's efforts, and we're proud because the city is moving forward and our schools are moving forward. But there's one more piece, and I know the Chancellor will speak to it. It's not good enough if the overall numbers are increasing, but the disparities that were so typical in the past continued. We are now seeing some real progress on closing the achievement gap. We are now seeing that all the initiatives that we put into play, including those AP courses and College Access for All and Computer Science for All, they're all starting to have a real impact. And that achievement gap is starting to move. And we're starting to see more and more equity. Everything you're seeing here is proof that it can be done. So if you meet anyone out there who says that New York City public schools can't reach the highest heights, tell them to come to New World High School and yeah. see for themselves. <laughs> Just a few words. In Spanish, and I want to say, you know, uh, I just have to tell everyone this, that, you know, at City Hall in your borough this week, we're in the Bronx, and we did not know what day these results would come out. But I am especially happy that the state released these results during Bronx week, so we could come right here and celebrate, because the Bronx led the way. The Bronx led the way. A few words in Spanish. There you go. There you go. Okay, okay, I remember that. There you go. I forgot that's supposed to be the official beginning of the press conference. 
Few words in Spanish. Hoy es un gran día para nuestra ciudad. Por quinto año seguido, nuestros estudiantes han logrado un nuevo récord en las tasas de graduación. Como el alcalde cuyos hijos estudiaron en esas escuelas públicas, me siento muy orgulloso del progreso en nuestro plan de equidad y excelencia. Este es un triunfo de todos, el camino hacia una ciudad más justa empieza en nuestras aulas. The road to being the fairest big city in the nation begins in our classrooms, with our educators, with our parents, with our students, and you all should be very, very proud today. Thank you, everyone. And now, no pressure, Richard. <laughs> But the man who's going to beat the record again, <laughs> our chancellor, Richard Carranza. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I want to also echo your remarks about us being here at New World High School. What an incredible school. And what you may or may not know is that uh, the students at New World High School, the majority of the students at New World High School are what we would consider to be newcomers. They're new to our country. Many of them don't speak the language. And yet they're graduating at 90%. So there is no excuse why we're not going to just surpass that record, Mr. Mayor. We're going to shatter that record. And because it is uh, City Hall in the borough and we are in the Bronx, I just want to start by saying, here you go. <laughs> There you go. Here you go. <laughs> so needless to say, sir, I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, and I want to give another shout out to all the students and teachers here at New World High School uh, and their incredible principal. I want to thank you for opening your doors here to us uh, and our especially wonderful speaker who one day we will be uh, voting for, for higher <laughs> office, uh, Karen. And Principal Gashi, uh, you, you should be very proud of her because, uh, you know, she's got it under control over here. So I want to thank you for being here. I typically save my remarks in Spanish to the end, but I'm going to start with my remarks in Spanish, especially because we're here at New World High School. Quiero decir que de parte de todos los uh, educadores, los administradores, los estudiantes que laboramos todos los días para asegurar un mejor futuro para nuestros estudiantes, es con gran orgullo que estamos aquí hoy presentes a celebrar este logro de graduación. Para nosotros... Todo lo que tenemos que ver es que nuestros estudiantes crucen por ese escenario con su diploma y es su boleto hacia un mejor futuro. Entonces, aquí en esta escuela, en donde tiene 90% de sus estudiantes que se están graduando, y en el sistema en donde tenemos casi 66, 66% de nuestros estudiantes que se están graduando, estamos nosotros en una posición de ser los líderes en el estado de Nueva York y en la nación. Entonces, felicidades y nos engullece estar aquí a celebrar eso. Now, for those of you that don't speak Spanish, I just said we're really happy to be here. <laughs> it takes a lot more words in Spanish, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful circular language. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I came to New York City uh, was that I shared the infectious commitment that Mayor de Blasio has for equity and excellence, and he and I share that passion. When I arrived last April, I came to understand that there was a culture of equity and excellence in the New York City public schools. This is a shared mission, not just of the mayor and the chancellor, but of our community, of our principals, our teachers, our parents. Uh, that's what you heard from Karen. She expressed it more beautifully than I could have ever expressed it. You heard about the best of New York City here at New World High School. So much diversity, so much talent, the highest expectations, the, the hardest drive on the part of our students. Uh, and I want to take this moment also to give a shout out to my predecessor, Chancellor Carmen Farina, who worked very hard to put those building blocks in place that we can now take and move even farther. So I want to thank her for her selfless work when she was here. 
Now, Karen also talked about AP for All and the difference it's making at this school. I'm proud to say that this school has tripled the number of students enrolled in AP classes. And think about how they're shattering expectations. The notion that a student that's learning English cannot take advanced placement classes, they're shattering that. Triple the number of students taking AP courses this year compared to just two years ago. In fact, I was just at a celebration where we celebrated that AP for All has resulted in over 220,000 additional students taking AP courses. Now, when you think about that, those are just six digits. But if you think about 220,000 students, and those are high school students, if they were their own school district, they'd be the largest school district in America, sixth largest school district in America. That's the impact that equity and excellence is having in our city. So it's no surprise that at this school that represents New York City and its beautiful diversity so well, we are seeing results that represent New York City so well. The mayor talked about our record high four-year graduation rate, 2,600 more students earning their high school diploma. He talked about our record low dropout rate and the fact that we're making some real progress on our opportunity, some people call achievement, opportunity gap between our black and white students, our Hispanic and white students, each gap has decreased by about five points over the course of this administration. I think it's important to point out also that these improvements aren't happening in a vacuum. You see, there's incredible work happening in our schools every day, whether it's more AP courses, the SAT school day, more college visits, counseling that raises the bar as part of our equity and excellence agenda for all. All of these things are part of equity and excellence. Whether it's those things that, are, uh, that the schools are able to afford to provide with the 800, think about this, $800 million that this administration has invested in the fair student funding formula. Or it's just the good roll up your sleeves hard work of teaching that Mayor de Blasio cares so much about and has invested so much and so deeply. It's no surprise that it's not just our graduation rate and our dropout rate. It's our record high college enrollment rate. It's our record high college readiness rate. It's our record number of students taking and passing AP courses and taking the SAT exam. Our schools are stronger than ever and getting stronger by the day. I want to step back for a moment and talk about something you may not expect me to talk about. But as someone that's new to the system, I can appreciate this with a new set of eyes. And I want to talk about mayoral control for our schools. For years before mayoral control, graduation rates hovered at around 50%. They actually hovered. But since New York City got mayoral control, those graduation rates started rising and they have not stopped rising. It's because with mayoral control comes accountability, innovation, and results. The ability to think big and put policies in place to turn those ideas into action. And the accountability that the mayor of the city feels for those results along with the chancellor and leading that charge is something that puts the very square peg of accountability on us where it belongs. The ability to think big and put the policies in place is something that is quintessentially part of mayoral control. It better serves our students and our families. And I want to say that I'm proud to have come here to be hired by a mayor to lead the incredible work that's happening here in New York City. So I'll end on this note. Mayoral control our equity and excellence agenda and all of the components of our agenda are twin engines that have gotten us to this point. But it's time to kick it into a higher gear. Even as graduations rise and dropout rates fall across the board, we must do more to close the opportunity gap that exists. Let me say it again. We must do more to close the opportunity achievement gap. We cannot achieve excellence. We cannot achieve equity without that. It's why we will continue to deepen our equity and excellence agenda, programs like our 3K for all, our universal literacy, so our children get off to a running start, AP and AP for all and college access for all, all so they graduate on a path to success. It's why we're investing in school climate initiatives and culturally responsive education so that all of our students know that they are welcomed, they are accepted, and they are respected every single school day. It's why we're launching, and I'm proud to say this here in my favorite borough, the Bronx. 
We're partnering with our educators, our teachers, those people in the classroom every day around the Bronx plan. Yes. A plan that says we are going to invest in creating those conditions and moving those conditions for students to excel, to recruit and to retain great teachers right here in the Bronx. These are the investments and initiatives that will get us to where we need to be and empower all of our students, our schools, and our communities. So, today is not a good day, it is a great day. Congratulations and thank you to all of our students, our teachers, our administrators, our school communities for all you do. Let's celebrate today, let's say woohoo, let's do whatever we do to celebrate, and then let's roll up our sleeves and get back to work. Amen. I want to say thank you for all that you do. And I want to say to Karen, I'd be happy to walk some, uh, some uh, neighborhoods for you when you're ready to run for your office, OK? Yeah. Thank you. As usual, the chancellor is extraordinarily passionate and eloquent. I don't know about that woo-hoo thing, but <laughs> otherwise, I was right there with him. Uh, I want to I thank um, some of the folks who do so much here in the Bronx uh, because all these changes happen through leadership. First of all, just formally want to thank and, and acknowledge the executive superintendent, Misha Ross Porter. <laughs> Brought her fan club with her. There you go. <clears throat> and the principal here at New World, Mitat Goshi. Thank you so much. And a thank you to all our teachers and a special acknowledgement for the UFT special representative for high schools here in the Bronx, John Monteforte. Thank you so much. So it's Bronx week, and there's something else to celebrate in the Bronx, which is the assembly, the New York State Assembly Education Committee, which is absolutely crucial in terms of the, the decisions it makes and how it affects our 1.1 million students. Well, the dream we all have is when someone becomes the chair of the Education Committee, that they actually have lived the life of an educator. And so <clears throat> not only do we have a former public school teacher now as the chair of the Assembly Education Committee, we have a former public school teacher who taught in the Bronx yeah. <clears throat> and who lives in the Bronx and your assemblyman and represents the Bronx. The Bronx keeps moving up. My honor to introduce Chair Mike Benedetto. Good, e good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. This is, um, my head is swimming. It really is. This is a wonderful, wonderful day. The numbers that are good numbers are going up, and the numbers that are bad numbers are going down. That's what we want. And Mr. Chancellor, you are responsible. And Mr. Mayor, you are responsible for finding Chancellor Farina and now um, Chancellor Carranza. And I am so happy. It is about time that the Board of Education, the Department of Education, was run by people who are professionals and know what they're doing. And it's a, a great, great honor to see that happening. And the results are true. I had was talking to the young men and women behind me before, and I quoted to them Cervantes, who said, facts are the enemy of truth. And so I'm always suspicious of these, of these facts. And I've been around long enough to know there have been administrations who pretended to throw out facts and make themselves look good. But these are true facts. And you are to be congratulated. This is a good day for the city of New York. We have even brighter day com coming. And we got a group of kids behind me. And I, I forgive. Forgive me for calling you kids, but at my age, you're all kids. <laughs> okay, Chancellor, you're a kid, too, uh, as far as that goes. They're bright. They've got light in their eyes. They're enthused, and they see tomorrow in front of them, and that is just so exciting. And I want to do a shout-out to the teachers who have done so much, they do the performance, but I'll also say, and my apologies to the UFT, that CSA are the ones 
that keep everybody on their toes in the school and without the guidance of the superintendents and the principals in the school, the teachers won't perform the way they should. They have to be watched over, and you have done that. You have elevated them. They have elevated the students, and boy, they have made me so excited. Keep that going, and in the assembly, we're going to watch out for the, uh, the budget this year. We are providing money so that AP courses can be in the schools. We are providing money so that fees to apply for taking the SATs are wiped out for all students. We should get it down to zero this year because we know what we got here. We want them to achieve, and we know they will achieve. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Thank you. Good news, brother. Good news. I want to agree with the assembly member. There are real facts in this world. And then there are those other facts that often emanate from Washington, D.C., but these are real facts. <laughs> so last speaker I want you to hear from, uh, when it comes to supporting young people, is absolutely a labor of love for him. And I always can tell when someone is committed to a cause, when they do it, when it's not easy, when it doesn't come with a big salary, when it comes with a lot of heartache. But I saw with my own eyes for years and years, Andy King, doing everything he could to help young people, including young people who really troubled and needed to be helped to a better path. Uh, that's been his life's work. He's continued that work as a city councilman. And uh, today, I, I made fun of him last night. I think I, think I scared him, because this is possibly the most conventional outfit I have ever seen on Andy King. Andy King looks like a really boring professor somewhere. <laughs> I knew, you, I knew you when you were interesting, Andy. Ladies and gentlemen, Council Member Andy King. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chancellor, I like the red tie. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, family. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon students. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, everyone that's part of the Bronx and beyond. And to all our educators, I just want to give a sincere thank you to all that you do to sacrifice your time, your energy, your life to make sure that someone else's child gets it right. That's what today is all about, a collective community effort to making sure that our students understood the importance of walking into a building and what their job actually was. It was to learn. It was to get the information to meet the qualifications so you can grow up and be a productive adult by meeting the standards and graduating. We're celebrating something great today because we know in the offices that we carry each and every day, we get rocks thrown at it, the littlest thing that say we got it wrong all the time. So this is a day of celebration for New York. It's a celebration for our students, and it's a celebration of accomplishment that you can because behind us is today's future. And they, are, so they need a hand for being today's future. I want to, I want to, I want to um, repeat a quote that, that came out of a young man last night um, at Richard Green Middle School, that when we continue to put resources in to help our students, that we have to help them feel comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. While the mayor was trying to figure out comfortable, being uncomfortable, the comfortable, uncomfortable, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. <laughs> um, but I understood where the young man was coming from because we do have to help our students feel comfortable about being uncomfortable, but then as they become comfortable being uncomfortable, that we allow them to educate and put the resources in them, that they're comfortable being comfortable because they're no longer being uncomfortable, but they're being comfortable because they are successful, <laughs> period. And they can walk around and say, I am not uncomfortable. When I walked in day one, I was uncomfortable, and I've transitioned from being comfortable with my uncomfortable to being comfortable because I'm comfortable because I am success. <laughs> You got that? You know who's on first, right? Wait. Andy, could you repeat that? <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm, I am excited about continuing to partner with the mayor and the chancellor to put the resources in to continue to inspire children when they walk into a school building that their only goal is to learn. Their only goal is to be successful. Their only goal is to grow. And I want to say thank you because in a system in a world that you have all been able to open up that lid of that can of equity that was allowed to absorb the world and the air in a history 
of a system that has been filled with discrimination and bigotry and lack of resources, regardless if it came from through policy or financial or personnel, you have changed the paradigm shift for us all to be better in the classroom to educate our children. I applaud you both. I look forward to a future, today's future, get doing what they got to do. And to everyone, remember, your participation is that much greater than helping our children. Why? Because people pay attention to people who participate. God bless and congratulations, Mr. Mayor. Andy King had a very good breakfast this morning. He's very energized and probably six cups of coffee. Uh, OK, so we're going to take questions on this announcement. We're going to take a brief break then. Then we're going to do an update on the weather situation, take questions on that. And OK, we're, we're testing your physical endurance. Well done. And, uh, and then we'll take questions on other topics as well. So first on uh, the announcement today and obviously anything education related, please. Okay, Chancellor Carenza, we met in May of last year and I said to you about the Bronx being the lowest performing borough and you agreed with me and said that the mayor and I know that the Bronx children are not performing up to where they are. This makes me so happy because this is what I want as a former parent leader, all the way up to the Chancellor's Parent Advisory Council, as I said to you. However, we need to do this in every school. And in looking at the results that just came out, Staten Island has achieved over your 80% figure. Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan have come closer to that 80% figure, but the Bronx is still 67.4%. How can we change that and achieve higher ratings from the Bronx? So thank you. I think we, we, um, we in this administration do not refer to schools or boroughs as underperforming. We consider them to be historically underserved because a community doesn't decide that they're not going to perform. It's about the investment and the targeted investment. Uh, as I mentioned, the over $800 million that this administration has invested in the fair student funding formula is a game changer. It allows schools to do different kinds of activities, different kinds of programs. It allows them to target resources to helping students move to graduation. Uh, we're really excited that the Bronx plan that we announced as part of our contract settlement with UFT, uh, you know, most people think about contracts and contract settlements as wages and working conditions. We transcended that paradigm and we said, let's take a borough that has historically been underserved and let's invest in the right things in that borough. Let's invest in the ability to recruit teachers and retain teachers by paying a differential. Let's invest in helping groups come together and be able to do root cause analysis and then implement their plan and there be funding for the plan. Let's take historic communities that have been at the middle or the bottom of the list and let's move them to the top of the list so that we're actually investing in a real way. That's what we're doing in the Bronx. Uh, so all I can say about what's happening in the Bronx is that you're just getting a peek of what's going to start happening, but get ready because the Bronx is a phoenix rising in the city of New York and we have passionate people ready to go. Let, let me add, because I think there is a very important distinction to make in terms of our focus on moving each part of the city quickly. The fair student funding is a crucial piece of the equation. And I want to thank the council uh, because, and obviously thank uh, the assembly, which has always believed in increasing uh, the resources for New York City with help from Albany at times, and then the resources we put in directly. There's been a very big change on fair student funding. But that is only one piece of the equation. That piece gets augmented with the Bronx plan, because now you're saying to schools that historically could not bring in the talent they needed, that we are adding additional resources. It goes beyond fair student funding. We're saying, if you need additional resources to bring in those science teachers, those math teachers, those foreign language teachers, that historically a lot of schools in the Bronx literally could not recruit. We will pay extra to those people so they can come here and incentivize teachers to come here and stay here and support the teachers in those subject matters who are already here. It is a very targeted focus on how we get each and every one of those schools to the 100% staffing level they need. If they don't have 
teachers literally don't have those lines filled, let alone the highest quality teachers, which we will be able to uh, recruit with this additional incentive. How on earth can the school reach its potential and the students reach its potential if you literally don't even have the full complement of teachers? So we're fixing that historic problem. But that is still one side of the equation. That's the school by school approach. The other side of the equation is the big uh, central thrust of equity and excellence. Because I've said it many times, I have not seen it uh, noted that often, but I want to make clear to people. When you look at what happened with pre-K, when you look what happened with 3K now, which is going to be 20,000 students in September, when you look at uh, AP for all, computer science for all, take all of these initiatives, they have disproportionately helped schools that were less advantaged. There's no question about it. We, there are a lot of these, you know, obviously for every single part of the city, and they're helping a whole host of different kinds of schools, but the disproportionate positive impact has been in communities that suffered that disinvestment. I don't think we've done a good enough job explaining how those two pieces come together. Because yeah. it was just fair student funding, you could have that analysis, but all these other things are being layered on top of it. And Bronx schools are disproportionately benefiting from all these waves upon waves of additional support. So we think it is going to be a time of renaissance here in education in the Bronx. Please. The charter school graduation rate declined this year by like two and a half percentage points. Um, what do you make of that? Why do you think that is? Look, I think I'm going to give my layman's answer. I think Richard and his team can give uh, a more expert answer. But I do think something bigger is happening here. First of all, I think more and more families are seeing opportunity in traditional public schools. So let's be real about the fact that there was a time not long ago where there was a certain amount of hopelessness in many families, and they felt they could not find a solution in traditional public schools, or at least not where they lived. That's what equity and excellence, in one way, to its core, is trying to address, that that historic sense of whole neighborhoods where people wondered if there was any good option for them, you know, that was an unacceptable state of affairs. So I think for a period of time, a lot of parents were looking away from the traditional public schools. They weren't seeing the kind of progress that they wanted. A lot has changed because of the hard work of our educators and our parents, and I think more and more parents in this city now think traditional public schools are the go-to option. So I think that's one piece of it. I think that's true probably in other parts of the state as well. I think the other piece of this is there has finally been a debate on the fact that there are charter schools and there are charter schools. Um, charter schools that, that uh, support all kids regardless of their abilities, regardless of whether they speak English or not, regardless of whether they have uh, a disability or not, regardless of whether they take a standardized test well or not. Um, those charter schools uh, I always respect and consider them natural partners in our work. But charter schools that focus on test prep, charter schools that try to uh, push away uh, kids who don't take tests well and literally encourage them out of the school, Charter schools that don't want English language learners or kids with disabilities, uh, they have been increasingly discredited. And I think the reporting, and I want to credit the media on this, the reporting looking at the specifics of those schools and what it means to parents and kids in those schools, I think it's made a lot of people think twice about them. So I think those two things are coming together. And again, I'm the layman. You all can come up and correct any nuance I may have missed. Um, but I think it's those two things coming together, and I think for the first time in a long time, traditional public schools are now poised to fully compete with the charter movement. We will always work with the charter movement. As I said, you know, pre-K is done with charter schools, 3K is done with charter schools, but now it's game on because our traditional public schools are getting better and better all the time. Well said. Thank you, Chancellor. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this isn't on grad rates, but it's on education. Sure. So I've been hearing from some physical therapists and occupational therapists at schools about their concerns about a union agreement they're going to vote tomorrow, um, and they feel that they are not being pay paid fairly compared to their um, colleagues, speech pathologists and others, um, and don't have the same uh, benefits as it comes to uh, when they have advanced degrees and stuff like that. So I wanted to hear your response to that. I'm going to be very top line because all I can say is in the briefings I've received, yes, there have been real concerns. 
I believe we addressed those concerns. You know, any labor negotiation, you don't have both sides saying we have perfection and singing kumbaya. But I believe the real concerns were addressed in uh, the final agreement. Uh, and, and we think it's a step forward. I don't know if there's anything else to add. Okay. Yeah. So when the state released test scores, you were pretty circumspect because of changes to the tests over time. Um, you know, in terms of graduation rates, the state has changed graduation standards several times over the past few years, including, you know, you no, you no longer have to pass a fifth regents exam. In social studies, you can, you know, substitute other assessments. Um, the, the cutoff score that you can use to appeal a low regents score has shifted, um, and students with disabilities now no longer have to pass any regents exams at all. Um, so I'm wondering kind of <laughs> whether you think this year's graduation rate is truly apples to apples comparable to last year. Again, I'll be the layman, and this one probably more than the others even requires the experts to step up, but I'll give you my own personal view of that. I, I you know, because I have a critique of high stakes testing, I am always careful uh, when, even when we're announcing good news, to qualify it uh, because I understand the limitations of high stakes <clears throat> testing. But graduation rate to me is a much more tangible thing. Um, it's clear to me this kind of progress, and I'm talking about the progress in the last five years we've been here, but also the progress in the previous administration, it's so clear and consistent that I think it transcends uh, the various adjustments have been made at the state level. I think it indicates something much bigger that's happening. Um, I hear the point loud and clear that there are variations, and I'm sure they have meaning, but I don't doubt that this is uh, organic information that we are continuing to move when it comes to the real ability to graduate kids. And also, there's another measure, and my panel of, jur of uh, judges will agree with I this, I think, if it was just in isolation and we didn't have another verification on the uh, college acceptance and the training programs and the other things that young people are going to, that 59% number is very important as well because we see more and more of our young people getting accepted. You know, this is not the New York City Public Schools accepting them. This is a whole range of colleges of all different kinds and other uh, training institutes and all sorts of things. To see that number keep going up, I think is an objective verification of the progress we're making. Want to add? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I also want to uh, introduce our Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Linda Chen, who is here, and also Michelle Palladino, who's with our Office of Policy and uh, Evaluation. Uh, so I'm going to ask Michelle to come up and talk a little bit about the technical question that you asked, Alex. But Mr. Mayor, you're absolutely right. If it was just a graduation rate, it'd be just a graduation rate, but compound that with college readiness, college acceptance, college persistence, all of the indicators triangulate to tell us that students are legitimately graduating and they're legitimately getting admitted and they're being successful. <clears throat> Couple that with there is a notion, you know, in my career, um, I've literally interviewed hundreds if not thousands of individuals for positions, and never once have I had somebody come in, sit, take a test, and the highest scorer gets the job. So we know it's much more than just test taking. It's much more than just graduation rates. So the multiple measures, the multiple pathways for students to graduate, I think are completely legitimate because no one's getting a pass. There are certain requirements that students have to and parents have to take to be able to pursue those pathways. Uh, but the goal at the end of the day is that they have an opportunity to move on. Um, and I would say that as part of our equity and excellence agenda, one of the things that the mayor has also touched upon is empowering with uh, knowledge our community so that they understand those multiple pathways and how those help students uh, move not only to graduation but to get admitted into college. Uh, the truth of the matter is that those of us that are parents that have knowledge, uh, that's the privilege we have because we know how the system works. Uh, we're actually working to make sure that everyone knows uh, what those, uh, those levers are as well. So I'm going to ask Michelle to talk a little bit about why we think it's apples to apples. Um, so, well, first of all, there weren't any changes this year compared to last year, so it is apples to apples in that sense. Um, second of all, uh, the, the overall numbers for the, particularly the appeals I think that you're referring to are very small. So it remains at 5%, um, which, is a, which is a pretty small population. And lastly, um, and sort of mixed up in there, was uh, a mention of the, the 
alternative pathways that some students are taking. And just to be clear about that, it's essentially providing them an opportunity to show proficiency in another subject, such as the arts or math or science. And in fact, most students do it through math or science. Um, and that too also remains a pretty small uh, percentage of the population, but it is a way for students to demonstrate their proficiency uh, in, a, in an alternative way. Do you have just yeah, so it's the overall or the, so it's 5% for the, for the appeals and 4%. It's like 20. Well, yeah, it's, no, I haven't. We can get you that. So it's uh, 2,500 for the, the appeals and 2,600, 2,500 for the four plus one and 2,600 for the appeals. About 70 some thousand students. Yeah, 75,000 in the cohort. So, small. Okay. Other questions on this announcement or on education? See if there's anything else. Rich. Mr. Mr. Mayor, so the original goal, as I understand it, was trying to get to 80%. Yes. Have you set a new number? In the We're year? going to now. We're going to. Um, look, this is, uh, I have to tell you, Rich, when we're waiting for these results, we never presume. Uh, this is now the, you know, the fifth time I've been through this, and we uh, don't assume that things move in a linear direction. We have to prove it, right? And uh, I think seeing this kind of progress, it's time for us to reassess that goal and aim higher. Uh, the original was developed with Chancellor Farina, and it was literally looking at our progress and then looking at the national dynamic. And at the time, I'm trying to remember the year. I don't know if any of my colleagues know offhand. I'm assuming it was 2015. But at the time, the notion of catching up with the United States of America seemed like a stretch goal because the history of New York City public schools was that we could not reach that uh, national standard. So the idea that we would get ourselves to that level was something that was a very powerful goal, but one we thought would take a lot of work. Uh, everyone knows the New York City public schools have a, a series of realities that in many ways make it much tougher uh, to provide the kind of education we want to to our kids. Um, but the goal we set was 80%. And the, the end point at that point, I need a refresher. The end point for that 80% goal was what year? 2026. 2026. So you can see already that we're on a trajectory where we absolutely will reset that goal, uh, aim to get to 80% quicker, and then surpass it. Any other questions on this announcement or anything else? Education? Yes, sir. You mentioned at a press conference now, I think, a week and a half or so ago that a, a update was coming about school turnaround and renewal schools. It, where, where does that stand, and do you have anything to say about it? It's hotter every minute. So hot you can almost feel. No, it's, we, we intend to do that in February, and we'll give you the exact date as soon as we nail it down. Yes? I also just wanted to ask, you guys both brought us um, the Bronx plan and sort of the pay differentials for teachers in the way of attracting um, high quality teachers to hard to staff schools. Um, Chancellor, I know that you know, in Houston you tried a similar sort of program. Um, the Houston Chronicle did an investigation of that and found that there wasn't a huge change in the percentage of teachers who were more highly rated. So I'm just wondering, you know, why you think this is likely to make a huge difference. Well, I want to start and then pass to the Chancellor. I mean, I want to say you want some bipartisanship. Uh, this is something the Bloomberg administration desperately wanted, and they could not achieve it in negotiations with the UFT. Uh, and I would say with all due respect to them, I'm not sure they approached those negotiations, meaning the Bloomberg administration, I'm not sure they approached those, those uh, negotiations in the most constructive manner. But over the last five years, there has been a, a very different relationship with all of our educators, UFT, CSEA, everybody. And, I mean, sorry, CSA and everybody. Um, and uh, the door was open to a different kind of dialogue. And so, to the question of why do we think it will work, I present to you the fact that probably for about 20 years, maybe more, uh, the leadership of our school system has wanted that because it was the logical way uh, to address what was a really unmovable problem. Otherwise, you know you couldn't fill those jobs. I mean, we can get you all the chapter and verse on how many schools did not have their full complement of teachers, could not fill those specialty roles, and that obviously adversely affected the <coughs> students. Uh, what else was going to work? You know, from our point of view, direct incentive was going to be the single most productive approach. 
but we could not get there unless we got to cooperation with the union representing the teachers. And now we have that in the framework of a bigger vision of how we make our schools more cooperative and effective in general. So I think it's the only thing uh, that's going to achieve the goal, but you speak to it. Yeah, so Alex, um, different circumstances in Houston. Uh, and in that, in that particular situation, there was an attempt to recruit teachers from some schools and move them to other schools uh, and using the differential as an incentive. That was mixed. Uh, I would disagree with the characterization. It didn't show any results. But it's not the uh, silver bullet. And I'm going to be really clear that it's another tool that our, our principals now have in their tool uh, box to allow them to not only recruit teachers to hard to staff uh, positions, but also to retain teachers in hard to staff positions. There is a churn because I was a, a principal in schools, like many of the schools in the Bronx, why I say I feel comfortable in the Bronx, uh, because there's a, there's a paradigm that happens that you, you go out as a principal, you recruit teachers, you interview the teachers, you get a great teacher, and after one year or a a year and a half or two years, that teacher then transfers somewhere else. And oftentimes it's not because they don't like the students, it's because they're commuting, they're paying tolls, they can't get parking, There's a, a, they, they have to be closer because they have a sick parent or a child. So the ability to be able to give this differential will help to solidify those teaching positions, keep people in place, but it will also help to be able to recruit and compete for talent as it comes in. It's not the only tool. You couple that with a good leader at the school site. You couple that with a place at the table so that teachers have a professional voice in developing what the accountability plan and the professional development plan is for the school. You couple that with the ability to, beyond the fair student funding formula, to also then be able to apply for funding to be able to enact the plan that is collaboratively developed. And then you bring in the committee. Now you've got a recipe of lots of different things that can help turn the corner in that particular area. So we're very excited about it. I know that our uh, partners in uh, with the UFT are also very excited about it. Uh, but again, I want to just uh, disavow any one of the notion that it is the silver bullet. There are no silver bullets. It is but one of many tools that now give us flexibility uh, to change that paradigm. Amen. Last call. Yes. So we've asked this question before, but I think that it continues to be relevant um, when we see these kind of incremental improvements over years that really add up. Um, those improvements started, as you mentioned, under Mayor Bloomberg yes. and have continued under your administration to very different philosophies toward education and improving schools. Yeah. Why do you think that the results have been fairly steady under those two different philosophies? Have they complemented each other in some ways, or why? Thank you for asking a vast existential question. I would say, <laughs> I, I would borrow the, the, the historic notion of synthesis. I do think that's some of what's happening here. Um, I Look, I often disagreed with Michael Bloomberg on education. I agreed with him on mayoral control education, and I was a school board member. And the reason I agree with him was I was a school board member. Uh, I, and I was in a school board that bluntly had fewer of the problems historically associated with school boards. But unfortunately, there were many problems. And the system had to be um, unified. It had to be professionalized. It had to be depoliticized. And I do think, to the credit of uh, Mayor Bloomberg, that the only way we were going to break out of sort of the gravitational pull of the past was to go to mayoral control. I think that inevitably and immediately started to unleash a lot of very good energy at the school level and helped get a lot of things done. I think, however, a number of the specific policies uh, limited the progress that could be made. I think there was obviously a very bad relationship between City Hall and the DOE leadership and teachers. I think uh, there was not enough respect for the role of parents. There were misguided policies like, quote unquote, grading of schools, which served to just confuse everyone. There was an obsession with high stakes testing. There was an overfocus on charters versus traditional public schools. There was a small schools philosophy, which proved to be narrow minded. Uh, I think what they did, some pieces of what they did, moved us forward to a point, but would not have continued to move us forward. We had to heal the system, and then we had to address the equity gap, and we had to invest. If we were not investing 
in schools that needed more help, we weren't going to move forward. And when we do talk to you about uh, the renewal schools and the history, you will see uh, the impact of those investments and why uh, some of these schools very particularly powerfully illustrate the power of investment. The other thing is, uh, with all due respect to the previous administration, and I do want to say I think Mayor Bloomberg cared a lot about education, but the failure to focus on early childhood, and I was involved in these fights, uh, could not get that administration to prioritize early childhood education. And we were not going to make uh, this school system all it could be, and we were not going to reach our children's potential if we didn't reach them at the age of four and ultimately the age of three. And that was never going to happen back then, and it's obviously the number one priority now. So all of those things define the differences, and I say synthesis because I don't think we'd be here today if they hadn't done some of what they did, but I think it would never have continued to advance this way if we didn't add a whole host of other measures and create a different balance and a different uh, focus on equity. Yes? Chancellor, now when you have the graduation rates here, like schools like this, New World, how are you getting the early children? Are you providing more gifted and talented programs for students in the lower grades? Well, I think part of what you'll see here is that these students, many of whom are recent arrivals, didn't have gifted and talented, and they're doing great. So gifted and talented is, again, we're talking about silver bullets, isn't the silver bullet, but it is something that we are actually looking at. How do we make it more robust? How do we make sure that it's representative? How do we make sure that we're actually putting kids on a, on a pathway? Um, I think what you are seeing, and, and because we're in the Bronx, I'm going to focus on the Bronx, what you are seeing with our executive superintendent, uh, Ms. Ross Porter and her superintendents is that there is a cascading uh, system now of goals so that perhaps in the past where the mayor talks about early education, uh, he talks about AP for all, the equity and excellence agenda, and we have goals that the mayor has set, those goals now become cascaded into the chancellor's goals. My goals cascade to the executive superintendents, which cascade to superintendents, which cascade to principals, which cascade to the school. Now, why is that important? Because we've gone from a laissez-faire system of a, a, a confederation of independent schools kind of doing their own thing, now to a much more unified approach around certain goals. I think that's why you're seeing the graduation rate that is increasing. That's why you're seeing the college going rate, which is increasing because we're all rowing in the same direction now. And from a just purely fiscal accountability perspective, it allows us to actually use our resources in a much more targeted, efficient, effective way, which is the goal of all government, right? Use the money for what it's intended to be used for. So this is a really exciting time for us, and I think that all of that has to do with how we're empowering students to do better. You were on a school board. I was a parent leader all the way up to the Chance Parent Advisory Council. I had more power than a school board member. Mm -hmm. And I got my information. That's why you see me sitting here. Yes. Because of how I got it. I appreciate it. But I, again, I stand by, I think, I think it was the right move to change to a different structure. And I think we've been able to build on it since then. All right. I want to give the last word uh, before we give our uh, students and educators a chance to go back to their important work. I want to give the last word to a man now, he can arrive at any point in the proceedings from my point of view because he is now in the majority in Albany. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I have to say this, this is the big X factor in 2019 is having a Democratic majority in the state Senate. It's going to change a lot of things for the city and a lot of ways going to help us make greater improvements in our schools. So to close up this section, I'd like to welcome State Senator Jamal Bailey. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. My apologies for my lateness. Today we, um, we, have, we have budget hearings. The executive's budget has been proposed, so we are asking agencies questions. And today we were asking MTA questions. So I, I could not miss the opportunity to ask the MTA certain questions, which I believe are, are pertinent, uh, specifically related around accessibility. We, we saw the tragedy that happened a couple of days ago. So it's very important to make sure that we are asking our all of us in government, making sure we are holding each other accountable. So I'll be as brief as possible as an attorney and a legislator can possibly be. <laughs> I, I, I'm really excited about the, the, the increase in graduation rates that, that we have in this, in this city, in, in this borough, but obviously we have a lot of work to do and I'm committed to the work. I'm excited that we have an education chair from the borough of the Bronx and Assemblyman Benedetto. 
I'm glad we have a longtime fighter for youth and council member Andy King. And, and while he remains in Albany, I must make sure that, that our Speaker of the Assembly continues to do yeoman's work in making sure that all children throughout the state of New York get educational equity. Um, as a public school child, K through JD, um, I, I recognize and understand the importance of, public school, of a public school education. And while there, we, we may disagree on the path to some places, like my father and I, he, when we drive to North Carolina, he likes to take the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. I believe it's inefficient. <laughs> I want to take I-95 because I think it goes straight through, but at the end of the day, we're still trying to get to North Carolina for our family reunion. At the end of the day, we have to focus on our kids, and we can disagree on how we get there sometimes, but our kids are first, second, and last. And as a father of a four-year-old entering kindergarten, I'm doing more research on schools than I've ever even done as a legislator. And so it's vitally important that we're here today, and success is now, but continued success. Thank you all for the time. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a very quick break. Let these good young people go back and learn and give your neighbor a round of applause. Everybody, come on. Clap right there. Now, you're sticking around for this piece for the yes, beginning? Sir. Absolutely. All right. Okay. So, good? Yep. All right. We're going to do uh, an update on the weather situation. Uh, my colleagues are here to address it with me. We'll take any questions on that, then we'll go on to other topics. So I want all New Yorkers uh, to know that we have uh, some challenging weather uh, today and tomorrow, and people should be aware, they should get ready for it. You can feel already today how cold it's gotten. It's going to get colder as the day goes on. It's going to get really cold tomorrow morning. And so I want everyone to be on alert, take precautions, uh, think especially about children and making sure that they are safe, uh, our seniors, uh, disabled folks. It's going to be a trying time, and we want to make sure that everyone is prepared. So uh, the cold is one part of the problem. We also have a very specific problem coming up later this afternoon tonight. It's very limited. It is a winter uh, squall. It's a very brief, very concentrated uh, outburst of snow. Uh, literally could be as little as 15 minutes. If you're in a particular part of the city, you might only experience it for 15 minutes or a half hour, but it'll be very intense in that period of time. So it won't be a lot of snow accumulation, 
but while you're in the middle of that brief period of time, it could even feel like whiteout conditions. It could be that intense. So everyone has to be ready for that. Uh, the, the word of the day here is for the rest of this day, if you can use mass transit, please do. Obviously, if you don't need to go out, that's ideal. But if you do need to go out, you do need to move around, use mass transit. Uh, if you have to drive, uh, either go soon or if you do end up running into these conditions, uh, the best advice we can give is pull over if you can, take a break again, could be as little as 15 minutes, but uh, it'd be better for everyone to be very cautious. Don't try and drive through it unless you absolutely have to. Uh, in terms of the school system, uh, I'll give the overview and obviously the chancellor can speak to other details, but uh, because this is a very brief period of snow that we expect, otherwise the central problem is just the cold temperatures, we will have after-school activities today. Uh, it's important for our kids, obviously important for our parents who depend on that as part of their children's schedule. But we certainly encourage parents who are in a position uh, to pick up their kids earlier uh, to do so. But after-school will go on as scheduled. Uh, and you'll hear from uh, Commissioner Garcia in a moment, but 700 salt spreaders are deployed now uh, to keep the streets clear and to help us avoid uh, icing conditions. Now, as I mentioned, cold now, getting colder. So the, tonight, uh, we're going to hear, we're going to feel uh, colder temperatures, and definitely uh, the wind chill is going to make it feel like you're down around zero. Uh, going into tomorrow morning, uh, we could have wind chill even below that, uh, negative 10 or even worse. So uh, tonight and tomorrow, Thursday, are the particularly intense cold times. Uh, we want people to be on alert. We want people to be ready. Uh, do not assume it's business as usual. Take special precautions. Some other quick notes, uh, code blue in effect. Uh, if you see anybody out in the cold you think need help, uh, if it's uh, a problem but not an absolutely urgent problem, call 311. If you think it's a life-threatening problem, call 911, of course. And uh, the NYPD and Department of Homeless Services will respond immediately. Uh, anybody who does not have heat, please call 311. It's very important. The best chance we have of getting your heat back on is if we get that call and we want to address it right away. Anything we can fix today before the even colder temperatures tomorrow we want to do. And then in terms of public housing, uh, we have a heat command center open. It is being staffed now 24-7 to respond to any outages. Uh, as of about 9 o'clock this morning, there was one development with an outage in New York City. Uh, and that was being addressed, I believe, is, has been resolved or is about to be. Uh, NYCHA is also opening heating centers uh, and activating heat teams in every borough uh, to get us through this particular cold snap. Uh, at this point also, stating the obvious, the question I get, uh, Chancellor, you'll appreciate this, anybody under the age of 18, if they see me on the street, they ask this question, will school be open tomorrow? Yes, school will be open tomorrow. Uh, they, they, based on all reports we have now, uh, we intend to have school open. If anything changes, of course, we will update everyone. Uh, let me just say a quick few words uh, in Spanish. Esta tarde será un poco difícil llegar a casa después del trabajo por la nieve. Si pueden, por favor, usen el transporte público. Uh, esta noche hará un frío peligroso que continuará hasta el fin de semana. Eviten los viajes innecesarios. Si pierden la calef calef oh, calefacción, calefacción, Bien. Gracias. si pierden la calefacción o ven a algún eh, con eh, problemas en el frío, llamen al 311. So again, anybody with a heat problem, really want to get those calls into 311. So Commissioner Garcia is here, Commissioner Esposito is here, Chancellor and his team are here, want to see if there's any questions on the weather situation. Yes? Uh, could the Chancellor address any issues at the schools in terms of uh, pipe issues, freezing pipes, um, kick off and wait in the yards at some of these schools? Will you encourage schools to open the doors instead? 
Yeah, so uh, we are un unaware of any issues currently in terms of the physical plants, so everything's up and running. Let's just keep our fingers crossed, make sure that stays that way. Uh, all of the schools have emergency inclement weather protocols, which they are implementing, so kids will be inside. After school programs, as the mayor mentioned, will be in effect. However, you will not see them outside. They'll be indoors. Um, if when the squall happens to hit. Uh, if students are still at school, we will keep students sheltered in place until the squall passes, uh, and then we'll be on the road. So there may be uh, just slight delays in, in some of the bus routes or students getting home. But aside from that, we are open, we're ready for business, and we're ready to keep kids warm and safe. Any other questions on the weather situation? Yes. We've gotten a report from at least one homeless shelter that they're struggling um, with heat issues. It was from somebody whose mother is living there, and they've called 311, they said, and they've called as many people as they can think, and they sent photos of kind of ice on the inside of the window, and that she's just very cold. Tell us where, and we'll go deal with it right away. What do you got? You don't know any systematic issues? No. I've, the, as I said, I've heard of only one development as of this morning in NYCHA. I've not heard anything specific about shelter, but if you can tell us the location, we will... Will you share it with the team? We will dispatch. Jacqueline, you'll follow up and make sure homeless services is aware, and we'll get someone right on it. Thank you. Anything else on the yes? I have a follow up just like her. I will share my address with the. Good. We appreciate it. Mr. Carranza would share those words he talked in Spanish. As far as the kids being in school and the buses might be delayed. Pues uh, quiero reforzar lo que acaba de decir nuestro alcalde, que las escuelas van a estar en sesión, no, se, no son canceladas, estamos en sesión. Uh, hoy más tarde vamos a tener una tormenta que va a ser breve, pero va a ser intensa. Entonces uh, no quiero que se preocupen nuestros padres de familia, Todas las actividades están en efecto, pero si tienen la habilidad, les pedimos a los padres de familia que vengan a recoger a sus niños temprano. Uh, si llega esa tormenta temporal, mientras que estudiantes estén en la escuela, vamos a mantener a los estudiantes fijos en las escuelas uh, para que sean ellos uh, calientitos y tengan lo que necesiten. Y cuando termine la tormenta, vamos a llevarlos, uh, si es por camión, a sus casas o van a poder venir a recoger sus niños. Uh, en En este momento tenemos planificado que mañana las escuelas van a estar en sesión uh, regularmente con todas las actividades uh, dentro de la escuela y afuera de la escuela. Okay. Any other questions on the snow situation? Yes. Yeah, just in terms of the temperature, any words of wisdom about the use of gas stoves or ovens for heating and space heaters and all yeah. that sort of thing? The, look, everyone, if there's a heat problem, repeat, uh, report it immediately so we can actually get the heat fixed. That's the way to best address it, obviously. But I understand why people attempted to use those temporary measures like opening up the oven or a uh, space heater, but there's a lot of dangers associated with that. And, you know, the most important thing is to make sure people are safe. Uh, too often uh, when people come up with that kind of temporary measure, uh, there's been tragedy. So it's much, much better to uh, call in the complaint. We'll get help to you. Uh, you know, do everything you can to stay warm, but be very, very careful about anything like a space heater. Okay, anything else, people, on the st storm, or it's just it's really the squall and the cold temperature? Going once, twice, okay. So I think you guys are good. Thank you very much. And you guys stick around? Okay. All right. We are now going to go to other topics. Yes. Okay. Now that you're in the Bronx. Yes. The Kingsbridge Armory. There was a deal made. Yes. It's delayed. It's in limbo. It's, like it's biblical. <laughs> What's happening with the Kingsbridge Armory? I need to get the latest update. Uh, uh, you know, there was a point. It feels now like a couple of years ago where I thought we had resolved the outstanding uh, issues and we were ready to move forward, and I have not heard an update uh, recently. Fighting. There were obviously issues with the private entities involved, but I'm saying from a government point of view, my impression was the city, the state, everyone was on the same page and we were ready to go, and that the problems were all on the private side. But we will get you an update today. I would like to know that myself, so we'll get you an update today. On fair fares, according to numbers we've gotten, um, only 107 people have signed up this month so far. No, we don't believe that's accurate. Okay. So we will get you an update. But look, this just started 
there's no question in my mind there's going to be a huge amount of take up on this. We expect tremendous participation. We're going to be doing substantial advertising campaigns about it. But again, the other thing right now is that we literally know the names of everyone who qualifies in the first uh, set of applicants and in the second set. So we're going to be reaching out to them. We'll do bigger advertising as it grows. But we know the exact people. We're going to be calling them. We're going to be uh, making it really easy for them to sign up. I think you're going to see a lot of activity quickly on this. Yes. Did Kevin O'Brien falsify his DOI form by leaving off information about why he left the Democratic Governors Association? And have you spoken with the association about why they didn't tell the city about his being fired over these sexual harassment? Yes, he falsified the form based on everything we know. I have not spoken to the DGA. Um, I'm disappointed because clearly uh, they had information, and when DOI reached out, I, you know, my strong impression is they did not share the information they had based on the, qu the very specific questions that DOI asked. Yes? What's the status of the negotiations with um, HUD and the Southern District and NYCHA, and um, do they plan on coming up with a real resolution or coming or you or um, asking for another extension? We are right now in what I would describe as round-the-clock negotiations. Um, I've talked to Secretary Carson a number of times. I've talked to the U.S. Attorney a number of times. This is a very, very intense, it's been this way for days. Uh, there are still a lot of very big issues, and uh, we remain adamant about the point that uh, we have to make sure we can protect the 400,000 people who live in public housing, uh, and that we can ensure that uh, there's accountability and, and local control of the situation so we can solve their problems. But uh, I will say that the negotiations continue. Uh, continue to be uh, productive in the sense that we're working through item after item, and uh, our goal is to meet the deadline. Yes? Uh, apparently, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, there are some residents in Manhattan who have taken to hiring private security um, in the face of what they say is sort of a deterioration of quality of life because they've absorbed uh, some homeless residents either in buildings, particular buildings, or in general areas. Um, I'm curious. What you would tell those residents? I would tell them that the precinct, which is um, you know one of the safest precincts in New York City, is uh, devoting resources to addressing uh, any quality of life concerns that they have, and Department of Homeless Services is focused on that as well. Uh, we're going back and double checking, but the data we've seen so far does not suggest that there's been an uptick in any kind of incidents. Um, look, if, if neighborhood residents choose to do that, that's their right, but I would argue that um, this is the kind of situation the NYPD can handle very effectively. Rich. Mr. Mayor, uh, at uh, City Council hearing today and under questioning by the Speaker, Amazon Executive Brian Huseman said they would not allow workers to unionize. Uh, it was uh, in re regard to the Long Island City facility, Johnson asked if he would, have, if he would be okay with letting the workers unionize, he said he would not agree to that twice, he said. What's your reaction to that? My reaction is that, uh, welcome, this is my message to Amazon, welcome to New York City. This is a union town, and there's going to be tremendous pressure on Amazon to allow unionization, and I'll be one of the people bringing that pressure. Um, let's talk about the different pieces of Amazon. In the um, plan we agreed to for Long Island City, which is not their distribution centers, it's obviously their second headquarters, uh, we got an agreement that there would be union labor in construction, and we got an agreement there would be union labor in the building services provided to the new facilities. The uh, distribution warehouse is a different facility. It's a few thousand people. It's certainly a substantial facility, uh, much smaller than the total number of jobs we're talking about in the headquarters, which is between 25,000 and 40,000. But it's a major facility. I want to see it unionized. Uh, we're going to bring a lot of pressure to bear. And I have seen Amazon, as big as Amazon is, there was a very substantial effort around the country to push them to agree to a $15 minimum wage nationwide. They resisted, they resisted, and then they caved. Uh, and I think there's a very good likelihood that's what's going to happen here. Apparently, this was in reference to the Long Island City facility, the unionization. So I, I want to caution. I believe the uh, I, I can't speak to all the people who were uh, uh, addressing the issue, and I didn't see the back and forth. But I do know from a labor perspective, I know the central focus I've heard from labor. I've certainly talked to a number of unions uh, 
in solidarity with their desire to see unionization. I think the first concern has been about the distribution facility. Um, the headquarters is going to have a lot of white collar jobs, obviously, uh, including a lot that wouldn't traditionally be unionized. The distribution center is the kind of classic location for unionization, as far as I can tell. Does it make you in any way question the welcome mat that was put out for them here? The goal we had was to bring 25,000 to 40,000 jobs to New York City, the single biggest jobs deal in the history of New York City. I, I don't have a doubt in my mind that it was right to bring the jobs because for so many everyday New Yorkers, and I've said it, it's, it's kids like you saw here graduating from our public schools, it's CUNY students, it's folks who live in public housing, they're going to have job opportunities through Amazon. We're going to get a huge amount of revenue from Amazon to help pay for things like affordable housing and all you know, what we're doing in our schools, et cetera. Uh, it's also very important to the future of our technology community, which is about the future of our whole New York City economy. So there's no question it was right to get them here, but I have been conscious from the beginning that once you're on our turf, you're dealing with our values and our special culture. And we're going to be very aggressive. Everyone's going to be very aggressive. I think they're going to go through a whole lot of pressure, and I believe that ultimately that pressure will win the day. Will? A couple of questions about Kevin O'Brien. Sure. I'll take them one at a time. Um, have you asked the DOI to make a determination if he did falsify his answers to on the background check? My staff has, and the answer is yes. From everything we can tell, it's a falsification. I have not, but I would ask the law department to consider what it means. I'm not familiar with the rules, but I'm certainly happy to ask the law department what the ramifications should be. On O'Brien, um, Governor Bullock knew uh, in, at the time about what happened, about the, uh, his exit from the organization. He knew that he came to work at City Hall. He met with you at Tracy Mansion. Um, should Governor Bullock have told you, should he let like the city know, what's your message to them? Look, it's a frustrating situation, obviously. Uh, I, I have to start by saying I don't know the specifics of what happened, and I don't know if there were any uh, uh, extenuating circumstances that the governor was addressing, like confidentiality issues um, from the complainants, that kind of thing. But it's personally frustrating. Um, if I had known, we clearly would not have hired him. It's as simple as that. So, um, you know, I, that's all I can tell you. What was your reaction just personally when you learned that he had done the same thing in a different organization? He quietly was let go and came to your organization, and the same thing was quietly let go. No, uh, they're very different situations. And look, the whole thing's disgusting, and it makes me tremendously angry um, that someone lied to us because clearly he did, and um, broke the trust of, you know, their colleagues and the people of New York City. It's not acceptable. And I, I think it's fair to say, you know, he's paying very serious consequences for what he did. Um, in our case, we had you heard from Georgia Pestana, who governed over the whole process. Um, we did everything quickly with serious consequences but with a, a real respect for the confidentiality of the complainants. And our bottom line was anybody, any f uh, potential future employer who called was going to be given a very clear message. Um, I don't know why the DGA didn't do that. As a Democrat, that's very troubling to me. Uh, the Department of Investigation called. You can see exactly the question they asked. It's an unmistakable question. The, and, and I'm saying this as a Democrat, I'm very frustrated with the Democrat Governors Association. They should have said to us, yes, there was a problem. We asked point blank, they should have said, yes, there was a problem. And then that would have uh, caused us not to hire him. So um, it, it's very, very frustrating. Um, but look, this is part of a bigger reality where what all of these instances are telling people is there will be consequences for these perpetrators, and we need folks who have been harassed to come forward, and we can act on it if they come forward. That's, that's the bottom line in all of this. So you yeah. can see the question they were asked. They, that actually hasn't been made public. Will you, can you make that public? Within today? the boundaries of whatever the law says, happily. But I'll let Eric work that through with uh, DOI. Yes? I have a off-topic question, which I think is now going to be an on-topic question. Can, it's all mushed together at this point. 
<laughs> so I just wanted to, the chancellor um, talked a little bit recently about like taking a broader look at curriculum and, and sort of the nuts and bolts of what students are actually learning. And I was just sort of curious if you could sort of be a little bit more specific about kind of what kind of review you're looking at, if you're looking at change, like changing the actual curriculum that schools can get, or like whether standards are changing, just sort of your thinking on that. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think it's important to start at the beginning. So the state of New York determines what the standards are for all students. So what should you learn at the first, second, third, all the way up to the 12th grade? They take regents exams at the 12th grade. So the state determines what should be learned at every grade level. In order to have students master those standards, there is what you teach in every grade level. That's called the curriculum. So what is the curriculum that you're using? The textbook is not the curriculum. So how and what and what do you include in that kind of teaching is really, really important. In New York City, there's been a history and a tradition of having wide autonomy in terms of the what curricular items there are and what is taught. Um, we have been uh, working with our administrators and, and our teachers to understand that there are certain things that we want to make sure is embedded within the curriculum. We want to make sure that the curriculum is tightly aligned to the standards, and we want to make sure that the curriculum is also reflective of who we are in New York City, so that it's multicultural, that we have African-American uh, experiences reflected in that curriculum, we have Asian experiences in that curriculum, et cetera, in every subject area. So as we're doing that kind of work, what we are doing, and Dr. Chen is leading this work uh, through her division, is to ensure that there is a framework that says your curriculum must be able to address these certain requirements to make sure it speaks to rigor, make sure it, it speaks to alignment to the standards. Uh, it's not about saying you will use this particular curriculum, but it's rather saying if your curriculum, whatever you're using, meets these, this criteria, you're fine. If it doesn't, then there's other work that we're going to do to make sure it's meeting those standards. So that's the work that we're engaged in. It's not sexy. It's not really high profile work, but it's the nuts and bolts work of aligning your system to the standards. Can you talk at all about just like what criteria you're considering? Sure, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Chen to talk, uh, talk about that. So um, the, the chancellor absolutely uh, addressed that, but specifically yeah. it is talking, oh sorry. Taller. There you go. Oh, nice. <laughs> Specifically, it is aligned to the state standards and looking at making sure that all students, when we talk about equity and access, all students have a right to a full curriculum aligned to the standards. So that's the, the, the standards and the framework will align directly to the state standards. The other piece is around culturally responsive education. That is incredibly important to us. And that is that we review our curriculum um, with the lens of does it reflect the diversity of our students across the city, um, as well as providing enough supports for teachers to be able to meet the diverse needs of students as well. So those are the types of criteria that we will be looking at and engaging our teachers uh, across the city in this. Do you have a sense, though, broadly of like how many schools well, yeah. anyone else? But go ahead. How many schools aren't providing curricula that are like aligned to the state standards or that aren't culturally responsive under that framework? At this point, we are working with closely with our executive superintendents and superintendents to look at that school by school. Yes. Okay, got a question for the chancellor. On uh, choosing the school principals, okay, uh, when the mayor was on a school board and when I was parent leader, 25 or more people f applied for a principal's job, and almost the same for an assistant principal. Mm -hmm. Now you're lucky if you can get three or four applying and the person is already chosen because they did interim acting that's in the school. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a certain principal without mentioning a name, who was an assistant principal at a public school in the Bronx. He and the principal were taken out because of poor performance and something else that happened in the school which I can't okay, so the get the answer to. Now, he, Help us out, we're, we're not gonna be able to follow all this. Okay. Go to the well, his mother, got him out of District 12 and into District 10, where she was a principal and now a consultant for DOE. Uh, this is the man who was written up in a newspaper for gambling online while being, you know, during school hours. On, and <laughs> there was a settlement. Now, the superintendent beforehand had to retire because 
Uh, you know, look, look, so, how does like this? this is filibustering via question. No, no. I'm wondering how a person like this, who was taken out of school as an assistant principal, who because of poor performance and something else, We're not gonna has. This, I'm going I'm to veto the question respectfully because it's about an individual case. The, the chancellor can talk to you about it separately. Go ahead. Anybody else? Last call. Yes. Mayor, uh, some months back, uh, there, uh, a group of nonprofits were concerned about uh, not receiving payment, and apparently they, they filed a new letter um, complaining of the same issue. They're, they're concerned that you know, they're facing insolvency. Is this, if this persists, I'm just curious what's, uh, what the issue is. Yeah, we, you know, with the nonprofits, first of all, tremendous appreciation for the role they play in the city. This is probably a city in America with the highest concentration of nonprofits. We depend on them. We support them. And it's very important to recognize a lot of them get a huge amount of money from the city government. We've been increasing that steadily. So uh, the irony is, as we have been providing more and more money uh, to our nonprofits, there's a lot more contracts that have to be agreed to, a lot more paperwork, a lot more um, checklists that have to be run. And that has taken some time. Some of it is literally because we gave them cost of living increases and we gave them new funding streams. We believe that. The, the backlog created by the new funding streams and some of the other issues will be resolved by the end of May. Um, so I want to see them get their money. I want to see them uh, have enough uh, cash flow, and their work is very important. So we do believe that will be resolved soon. Uh, we're going to also try and make other reforms to make the process simpler, because the last thing I want to see is, uh, especially smaller nonprofits that really need that cash flow, I don't want to see them struggle. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank you.